Thank you, Matt, and welcome to all of you this morning. This is the third breakfast in our series of leadership breakfasts. This is by far the, the largest turnout that we've had for any of the three breakfasts. And that in itself, I, I believe, is the, the introduction to our speaker. That's a, a tribute to Joe Rogers and a show of respect for, for Joe Rogers. There are many things I could say about Joe in an introduction, but I'm going to keep my introduction simple and focused as he has always preached in, in campaigns to keep your message simple and focused. A lot of things I could say, but, but one is that, that Joe is an example of someone who has overcome adversity in his life. Not many people know that when Joe graduated from high school, he wanted to attend the University of Georgia, but he didn't have the grades, and he had to go to Georgia Tech instead. <laughs> and with that vocational degree, he's still done well. <laughs> I met Joe when he was raising money for, for Johnny Isaacson. I have since found out that Joe was one of the, the original contributors and supporters of the Georgia Public Policy Foundation. Joe is a unique individual that he puts his money and he puts his work where his mouth is. He raises money for, for Eggleston Children's Hospital, for Scottish Rite Children's Hospital, and for lots of candidates, uh, some of which are in the room here today. But when he says he's for someone or something, he also makes a contribution and he asks other people to make contributions. But one thing not many people really know about Joe, and this is really true, is that Paul Coverdale would not be in the United States Senate today if it were not for Joe Rogers. When Paul Coverdale announced in September of 1991 that he probably was going to run for the Senate, he was greeted with some support and he was also greeted with some laughter as Paul was not exactly the person that was selected to be the most uh, qualified candidate to run for the Senate and he probably wasn't going to win according to the prevailing wisdom. Joe Rogers loaned his credibility to Paul and he wrote a letter to several thousand Georgians, friends, family members, business associates, and political contributors. That letter gave Paul Coverdale instant credibility and also made it possible for Coverdale to meet the first payroll in his campaign because he had no money in the bank when the first, first payroll came around. That was a critical juncture in the campaign, and, and Joe Rogers gave Paul Coverdale the credibility and the financial backing and the base to get through calendar year 1991. Had Joe Rogers not come forward, Paul Coverdale might not be in the Senate today, but that was the first time. The second time was in the fall when we were trying to design our media campaign. Throughout the campaign, Joe had kept saying, keep your message consistent, keep it simple, keep it focused. He preached it. He never tried to tell Coverdale what the message should be. He just said, keep it consistent, keep it simple, keep it focused. The campaign was going to come down to a media battle with White Fowler, and we thought we had our media campaign sketched out. And I met with Joe Rogers at Paul Coverdale's home for an hour and a half and went back to the drawing boards after that meeting because we didn't have our media campaign sketched out. It wasn't simple, and it wasn't focused, and it wasn't consistent. And because of Joe, the media campaign, we dropped seven or eight ads. We focused in on four ads for that campaign. They all ended with exactly the same tagline. They were very consistent. They were very simple. They were very focused. And Coverdale has gotten all sorts of national attention and awards because of his media campaign but his media campaign would not have been there had it not been for Joe Rogers. So from initially giving Paul Coverdale his personal credibility, raising the money to make his payroll, giving him a base of support to build on, and then making him focus his media campaign, Joe Rogers, more than anybody else, is responsible for our freshman United States Senator. He is a man I would be honored to raise my children if I died. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you my good friend, Joe Rogers. Good morning, and thank you, Tom. I've been insulted now. Uh, I've been embarrassed by your introduction. I wish I could take all the credit that you offered me, but uh, uh, really, that probably is a little misplaced and goes to a lot of people that you see in this room. Uh, it's easy to say there are folks in the wings behind the scenes that, that uh, support others who get out there and run, but it's really the candidates that do the work. And those of you who 
who look at it as a profession that deserve the credit for the wonderful results the Republican Party has been getting lately in this state. I've also been insulted that you would serve me breakfast this morning <laughs> and suggest that we have this meeting somewhere other than a Waffle House. <laughs> Although I'm afraid if we took this crowd in, it would be a little disruptive. Um, as I look around the room, I see a few faces that I think I saw last week during the snowstorm. And um, I'm just glad this wasn't scheduled then so that we can get on with it. But I know all of us probably have rescheduled commitments from last week. So we'll try to make this brief and get on with it. They asked me to speak to you today about why business people, I believe, should be involved in politics. Is, is that the topic? OK. I want to make sure I got it right before I start telling you tech Georgia jokes and wandering around. I'm sure I could insult some other people in this, in this room. Let me talk to you about three things this morning. Perspective direction, and myth, or mythology. And maybe through the talk or at the end of it, you might say, now wait a minute, that's direction, that's not perspective, that's myth. If you think my perspective is mythology, that's OK if we disagree. But perspective, direction, and myth. When I think about business people, and I think about government, I look at our society and ask myself, who is it that has a broad perspective on what goes on in the world, America, or wherever? Politicians, many of you in the room are politicians, claim to have, and the ones I like, I know you have, all of you claim to have a very broad perspective on society. Business people have a broad perspective because of what we do. We make and sell goods and services. We employ people. We have health care plans. We pay taxes. We develop property. Anything that you can do in society somehow weaves its way into business. So we have a pretty broad perspective. Broader, I would suggest to you, than the people in the professions of medicine, law, science, education, maybe even a little broader than the press, or maybe a little deeper than the press <laughs> some days. So why be involved? We have perspective. You see, I don't come to you today as a business man. I come to you as a working person. One of the myths about my job is that I'm an executive. I am not a corporate executive. I'm a working person. I spend most of my time in our restaurants working side by side with 15,000 people who work hourly. And I experience their lives, not mine at home, theirs on the job and theirs at home. Yesterday, one of our salespeople, you'd call them a waitress, at Indian Trail in 85, had a problem getting her furniture paid off with the mail order firm that she'd bought it from. So that's what we worked on yesterday. She also wanted to know who she could get help from to fill out her taxes and talk to me about her rent payment and her concern about how much money she was going to have left over. The Waffle House business is pretty simple. Many of you are in much more complicated businesses. Ours is a working business. And that's where my perspective comes from. Let me share with you a couple of thoughts on perspective that I think are important. Let's look at a couple of issues. Taxes. It's a popular topic today. How many of you in this room think you're going to pay more taxes this year? How many of you in this room think that the well-off are going to pay more taxes than the not-so-well-off? How many of you think the opposite? That's right. There are only 250 million people in America, and they pay all the taxes. I'm not a taxpayer in the business. I'm a tax collector. All institutions, business or otherwise, that remit taxes to the government are simply tax collectors. That's perspective. It's not a perspective you hear 
from our government, our president, the politicians in Washington, and let's talk about the Washington scene primarily, who tell us that they're going to tax a certain group. Last year, our little company sent $50 million to taxing authorities. Our sales were okay. Our profits were okay. Our return on equity was okay. So had we not had to send that $50 million to those taxing authorities, we would have let you have it in lower prices. That's $50 million we didn't need that we would not have had to have collected in prices. I'm a tax collector. I'm not a taxpayer. It's the hidden taxes. Let me suggest to you another perspective. Taxes are the major component of inflation on the margin. Now, where is that perspective going to come from? They're going to fight inflation, but they're going to raise taxes. You see, taxes raise the price of life. Most people think in terms of inflation, well, the bread went up, the gasoline went up, and they say, well, there's a tax on gasoline. Okay, I see that. Or energy prices went up. But taxes are inflationary. When taxes go up, let me suggest to you that the smartest thing Reagan did to break the back of inflation was lower taxes. The price of life went down. What people experience about inflation is what's real. What they think about it is just a thought process. What they experience is the price of life changes when taxes go up. And let me suggest to you, Mr. Clinton's going to rekindle some inflation. Perspective. If business doesn't bring that perspective forth, who will? Because business is the one that gets tagged with being evil along the way. Let's take a couple other issues. Health care. Now, I probably disagree with many people in this room. I've disagreed with all the politicians I've talked to. I fundamentally believe that every human being within the borders of this country deserves access to health care. And we provide it in our business. We have an affordable plan. I didn't say it was painless. Because it's insurance, it costs. But it's affordable for all of our hourly associates immediately when they begin work. We don't know of any other restaurant chain in America that does that. It's affordable for us. Of course, they pay all the cost. We realize that, another perspective. We don't pay the cost of insurance. That's money the company would be indifferent, whether we pay the insurance company or give it to the associate. We're indifferent. We don't have it at the end. So what difference does it make to us who gets it? People pay all taxes. People pay all costs. There are only people. There are no companies. There are no institutions. There are only people. But we make available affordable health care. And I think, quite frankly, we can make available affordable health care to everybody in the United States and do it outside the government. You see, there is a market solution to that. Deficits, another perspective. The deficit, the federal deficit is meaningless. To believe in the deficit, you better believe in the accounting system that the federal government uses. And if you do that, then you need to start with the remedial accounting course at the University of Georgia. And then come to graduate school at Georgia Tech. <laughs> if you believe in the deficit, you've got to believe in the accounting system, and it's flawed. It's failed. It doesn't work. It doesn't make any sense. You can't make sense out of nonsense. That's not common sense. What does matter is the percentage of gross domestic product. Whatever our total economy is in a year, what percentage all government takes. The money's going to get spent. The question is, who's going to spend it? You, my associates out there, my hourly associates that I work with, or are we going to give it to the government? to spend? That's the question. Who's going to spend it? It's going to get spent. Savings is an expenditure. It gets put somewhere. The question is who's going to put the money someplace? Perspective. Labor. I read Fortune magazine this week, one of the last two issues, talked about the child labor problem. It was apparent that the only source of their information was government agencies, local, state, and federal. 
And they hadn't really gone out and talked to anybody, any people. And they hadn't talked to any businesses. And they talked about how bad Burger King was because they just paid a record fine and child labor. And we fortunately don't have that problem because, quite frankly, ours are more highly skilled jobs. And we just found that it doesn't make sense to hire young people for those jobs. But tomorrow, tomorrow, if there were no minimum wage below the age of 18 or 21 and you did away with half the child labor rules, we would employ 400 more young people in Atlanta, Georgia at a dollar, two dollars an hour, cash wage, pay them out of the cash register, and give them a free meal. Well, a meal for their work, it's not free. And what would they do? They'd clean up the parking lot, clean up the restaurant fronts, clean the restaurants. It's what I was doing when I was 14. It's better that they be working at something than standing on the street corner. Our biggest problem with our youth today is they're unemployed and they have no direction. No wonder they don't do well in school. They don't see any value in it. Perspective. We could all talk about our favorite list of pork items, so I won't get into that. Another perspective. What works in government and what doesn't work? Our federal government today is still a post-World War II organizational structure. There have been a few other of those around lately. General Motors, IBM, Sears and Roebuck. Uh, that aren't doing so well. Government does some things well. The IRS does a pretty good job of collecting taxes. The justice system seems to work okay. Maybe not great, but who else would do it? The defense program works. We found that out every time we fought a war. Politicians don't always work in support of it, but it works. Who else would do it? But there are some things in government that don't work. Raise your hand if you can feel the effects of the Department of Education in your child's education. One or two of you. Let me suggest to you it has no business being there. Federal government didn't go educate anybody. That's a local and state thing. The Department of Energy, it's a joke. They're not going to make any energy. And they're not going to make any effective energy policy. The government needs to be overhauled. That's perspective. Where is the voice of business? You see, there's some laws out there. There's the laws of nature, you understand. The law of gravity that you understand. There's the law of financial gravity. Some people in this neighborhood in the real estate business found out about the laws of financial gravity. There's the laws of social gravity. You can't keep propping people up generation after generation. Welfare don't work. We found that out. Those people need help. Remember, I'm going to take the other side of that argument than most people. Health care, social reform, and helping those who need help. Because a lot of my friends out there who work to put my kids through school need help. So I'm not that arch conservative that says no government. But smart government makes more sense than dumb government. And we got some dumb government today. If business isn't involved, who will be? Let's talk about direction. Is direction important? If you and I start right there on that center line, on that tape today, clear out everything in our path for the next 20 years, and you start maybe 10 degrees that way, and I start maybe 10 degrees that way, how far apart are we going to be 20 years from now, a long way. You see, that's where we are today. Little differences 20 years ago create big gaps today. Pace is not important. Pace is not important. Smartest thing I ever did in business was to run marathons in my early 30s before I started having children. Ken Hoos and I ran a half marathon somewhere 10 years ago, I recall. And you learn it's not pace. It's direction and just staying with it. And in fact, you passed a lot of the sprinters later on. But if you couldn't find the finish line, there was no hope. Direction's important. Pace is not. Because it is a marathon, it's not a sprint. Little differences today create big gaps 20 years from now. 
And as adults, what do we have? 10, 20, 30 years to influence things? That's really all. From the time we're prepared to shape and influence opinions in our community or our state or our nation or the world to the time we pass it along to somebody else. And if we don't participate in that process, who will? Direction. Tom spoke about money raising. I always get called to raise money. I rarely get called for advice. So I'm going out of the money raising business and start giving free advice. And you know what that's worth. You're getting, well, you paid $30 for it this morning. So you're getting $30 worth of advice. I've raised a lot of money. Eight, nine months ago, I was with a group of people on a little retreat. Fourteen company presidents, all of whom I had tapped for various campaigns. And I was talking to them about Paul's campaign. And they were begging the question about the candidate. Paul invites some begging of the question. Okay? He's a great guy, but he doesn't come off as John Wayne. So what? But they're begging the question. I finally threw my hat down on the ground and said, guys, we've been talking about politics and money for 10 years. Don't you understand that the candidate is not that important? It's the direction. You either support a direction in politics or you yield to the other direction. If you don't speak, if you don't fund, if you don't move in a direction, you're giving it to the other folks. My rule about financial support is simple. If there is a qualified, credible candidate, whether I think they got a chance of winning or not, if I think they'll sing with a credible voice and make a good addition to the choir, then they get my support. Because that Paul talked about in his campaign this coordinated energy, the nucleus of which was going to be George Bush's victory. Well, that didn't work out so well. But there was a coordinated energy in Georgia. You had four congressmen elected, plus a senator. There's a choir singing that direction or that direction. It's not the candidate. And yet, you ask somebody for $1,000, they're not going to miss the $1,000. And they talk to you endlessly and say, I'll think about it. And they're looking for the flaws in the candidate as opposed to simple. Are they credible? Are they moving in the right direction? If we don't support the right direction, we're going to get the wrong direction. Leadership. Leadership. And the language of leadership. From among all the people moving in the right direction, we've got to select some leadership along the way. That's where business has some talent. Business people spend a lot of time selecting managers and leaders and sorting that out. And we can be helpful in politics doing the same thing. Who among all of the choir should sing tenor? Well, that's obvious. The tenor. You pick the leader. Now, there are a lot of people who want to get up there and sing the solo. But you need to pick the leader to do that. That's an ongoing process. Direction also says that you don't buy the idea of the lightning strike the star candidate. That's what everybody's always waiting for, salvation. The savior to return, Ronald Reagan reincarnated. It's a team effort, folks. A good system produces an ongoing contribution of leaders. And if you wait around for the stars, you're yielding to the other direction. The language of leadership. Pick up the last issue of Forbes, pick up the last issue of Fortune and read them. Two different language styles. Both are supposed to be business. Oriented. If you read Fortune magazine, you get a little disappointed with the, the language that they use. You see, there are basically two directions in the language you can use in anything, especially when you talk about people. Your attitude can be, look, the cup's half full and filling, or the cup's half empty and leaking. Which direction? You know, we really are at the dawn of the future of America and our society. But if you listen to a lot of the popular people today, they talk about the downfall of things. That's not going to solve anything. Every generation has had problems, and yet every generation has made progress. 
The language of leadership provides hope and direction to people. The language of victims talks about despair. It's divisive. You know, the rich versus the poor. Totally inappropriate. You sow the seeds of your own destruction with that. Business knows that. You can't sell anything by saying, I know you don't want to buy this. And it's a flawed product. It doesn't work. Johnny can't sell any houses by saying, you know, this one's got a leaky roof and a high price. Which describes our government pretty well. And yet they, people go out and buy the White House every four years. Think about the language of leadership and influence it. Require of the politicians that they develop a vision and talk about the future and the hope and the promise and solutions that make sense. Complex versus simple. Yeah, I know I went to the North Avenue Trade School. But what that education taught me in those, uh, you got calculus over at Georgia. Um, in those math classes and those double E classes and, you know, that double E stuff, electrical, you got it, engineering, Tom. What you learn is that you can do a complex analysis of a lot of things. If you're in business, what you realize is that complex analysis is appropriate. Complex solutions don't work. Why? Nobody can implement them. Nobody can implement them. Complex analysis leading to simple solutions. I went to school in Boston at an unnamed school where they got a lot of bright people, many of whom are on Mr. Clinton's cabinet now, and they talk about all these complex things. Yeah, you can do a complex analysis of health care or taxes or defense. But let me suggest to you simple solutions. The smartest solution when you go through the valley of analysis and come out on the other side is the simple solution that everybody can understand, not just the enlightened few. You're in the dark ages if you think it takes complex solutions. Our welfare system is a complex solution to a simple problem. There are simple market-oriented solutions, and they'll work. But if business doesn't demand that, from our perspective, who will? Who will? When you think about, when you think about simple solutions, health care, give everybody a voucher. Give every taxpayer a voucher, individual and their dependents, and says you can redeem this monthly for your health insurance premium. And then tax it back with the IRS and stay the hell out of it. The rich people pay back the voucher. Poor people don't pay anything. And by definition, you catch all the nine taxpayers at the hospital. Because they show up, they got to sign up. Now, if you make it available and people don't use it, there's not much else you can do. You're still going to have some indigent health care. There are some helpless people out there. But there's a market system to health care, a market solution. There's a market solution to public housing. Public housing is plantation housing. That's all it is. It's the modern day equivalent of plantation housing. It's an insult to people. You don't insult your friends. That's not smart. See, I'd come down on the other side on immigration too. I believe in open borders. I think you ought to have orderly processing. But I believe you ought to let everybody in so that when you catch the illegal immigrant, or illegal alien as they're called now at the hospital because they, have, they don't have any insurance because they're not a taxpayer, you enroll them to become a taxpayer and make them a citizen. Say, I believe in the golden rule. Where would you be if we didn't have open borders? If it was good enough for you, it's good enough for me, it's good enough for them. I think everybody's welcome in this country. Everybody. Mythology. America's invincible. Not so. Not so. Only if we protect it. And the way you protect it is build it. Start playing defense, you're going to lose. Start playing defense, you're going to lose. You've got to play offense. Business knows that. When business hunkers down in a defensive posture, it always lose. loses. You make it by getting out there and making the sale. We love the snowstorm. We hated the snowstorm for the inconvenience and the, the tragedies that you 
you heard about. And there were some. But gosh, our business boomed. We had a ball. Most of the time. We stayed open. That's why we're there for the customer. That's our outlook on business. That's our attitude toward business. We're there for the customer. And fortunately, most of our people believe in it. And they're proud of what they did. But America's not invincible. Go along, get along. I talk to so many people in the business world who play the go along, get along game. What year was the sales tax increase? 89. 89. Spring of 89, April. Spring of 89, here comes the state of Georgia. At that time, I was on the board of the Business Council of Georgia. And a group of those folks had this transportation thing they were running around the state suggesting we ought to have a uh, gas tax sponsored by the Business Council, a dedicated gas tax. <coughs> My view of that was they were the stalking horse of the speaker who was looking for something else. And we found out late in the session what it was. We raise, I shouldn't say we raise, we consider our menu prices three times a year, looking at little, small increases or decreases, depending on inflation, and we always try to lag inflation. So we're always trying to figure out what inflation was. Spring of 89, inflation was ticking up. And here comes the General Assembly with a 1% sales tax increase, which adds 1% to inflation, just like that for everything you buy. So creeping toward four, all of a sudden it was creeping toward five. And we saw a downturn in business. No wonder. You don't raise the price of what people want less of. It doesn't make any sense. You see, there is the law of sense. You can't keep defying that. And yet our taxing policy somehow does that. If that had been football, they'd have gotten a 15 yard penalty for piling on. Somebody would have thrown the flag. You don't pile on your people. You're there to serve. Sam Walton talked about it well in his book, Servant Leadership. That's what our legislatures and our presidents and our governors ought to feel they should be doing, providing servant leadership. You don't pile on. What good has the go along, and oh, by the way, the business council said nothing, and I fell out with it. I said, what do you mean? Business doesn't raise its voice to an unneeded 1% increase in the sales tax? Why not? Well, we're going to get a little compromise here, and they're going to support us on this workman's comp thing later, and so forth. What good has go along, get along done everybody? Add up what good it's done. I know it's convenient at the moment, but it produces nothing. Strength produces something. Firm position produ produces something. A unified voice produces something. In this, oh, everybody gets involved in the intrigue. I call it the soap opera behind the scenes. Several of you have heard me talk about political soap operas. Stay out of them. Business can bring that to the table. Term limits, mythology. That's my guess. I've helped folks who have because it's, it's sort of a rising passion. It's sort of like the sap rising in the trees. People have got this passion about term limits. Fundamentally, I think it's inappropriate. Why should you deny the people the right to elect anyone? Doesn't make any sense. So if it doesn't make any sense, then one of these days it won't make any sense. But we find that out the hard way. Ross Perot. Business has sort of been charmed by Ross Perot. He's got a lot of great ideas. But you've got to ask yourself, why is he there? If today Ross Perot had standing around him a dozen recognizable leaders in America singing in the choir, saying there is a movement afoot here and we want to take this country in a different direction, you know, I'd start looking at that thing more seriously. But people who continue to be solo acts, to me, are in it for the ego. Had he really wanted to do what he said he wanted to do, he wouldn't have run for president. He would have started a movement. We've seen other examples of that. Jerry Falwell tried to do that and did it somewhat successfully. Other people have tried to do that. If Ross Perot wanted to change America, he, wanted to, he would have started a movement. So I view that as an ego play. You may disagree with me. Perspective. Perspective. So where does it all come down? Business folks 
working people have a perspective. Those of us charged with the leadership of businesses are the collective voice of all the people who work in our businesses. We're the collective voice of our customers at times. Who better would know what's on their minds than us? And if you don't know, maybe we need to talk about how you run your business. Who better, though? And where are most of the jobs in America but in business? And where does most of the money come from but commerce that makes defense or health care or whatever else affordable? The court system doesn't produce a lot of revenue. So where does it all come from? This is a free country. We believe in free enterprise. But somewhere we veered off a little way in direction. You're all hampered by government regulation. You ought to be in the restaurant business these days and have health inspectors coming around telling you things that really are myth. Very interesting experience. Or the Department of Labor coming around. We just settled a case with them on some minor stuff. Uh, because technically we were doing it wrong. Economically, we were way to the, to the good. But they wouldn't let us count the subsidy for the health care of our associates of several million dollars a year, the stock bonuses that we provide, vacation <coughs> money that we're not required to give our hourly associates. None of that could be counted given their regulations. So technically, we had a shortfall of dollars we owed that turned out to be about 1% of what we figured we had overpaid according to their regulations. Lunacy. They thought they were going to run over us. Uh-uh. You don't get anywhere playing go along, get along with the government. It doesn't work. Perspective. What do you really believe from your position? Direction. If I were to ask your friends, could they tell me the direction you were going? Not how fast, not precisely, but generally, could they describe the direction that you support? And then don't be a victim of the myths. Don't let them grab you and hang on to you. Oh, you can't do that. Business can rise up and do anything it wants to in America. But as long as it's bamboozled by the, the political system, it won't. I heard somebody in to talk one day uh, urging people to action with the line of, uh, uh, if not now, when? If, if you don't do something now, now being every day along the way, then when will you? And if not me, then whom? Are you waiting for the other person? I'm not a politician. I'm not running for any office. I've never given a political speech before, if that's what you would call this. I've only ever introduced <laughs> politicians. The only talking I've ever done has been in business, and really only to people in our company. But we talk about just this, because this is the way we run our business. So when you leave here today, go look in the mirror and ask yourself what you're going to do, not just today if you're fired up. Or maybe you're discouraged. Nobody's thrown anything yet. but. There's, there's still time. But are you going to stay fired up? It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Little things add up. Little things add up. I've enjoyed being here with you this morning. And if there are any questions from anybody, I'd be glad to answer those. Although I think we have people in the audience who can do a far better job of that than me. Thank you for having me.